Welcome to Pharma Docs with your host, myself, Dr. Jay Resnick, and Dr. John Robertson. Practicing oral surgeons bring you the latest and greatest in pharmacology as it affects you in your daily dental practice. Well, hey, John. Happy November. J- Jay, happy <laughs> November to you. Can you believe we're almost through the end of the year? I know. Uh, Mammoth opens tomorrow. Oh, yeah. good gracious. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I think, oh can I, maybe I'll take a few days off of work and go up there next week. No, nah, we'll not you. you. You love to work. You you can't get out of that office, man. You you love it. You love it. <laughs> I'm uh, trying to get out of it more and more as I get older. Oh, okay. So we're, we're, we are 10 months into pharma docs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jay, where else would a dentist go to get their information on pharmacology but the pharma docs? Huh? I have, I have no clue. I, I mean, have think no about idea. it. Who, who else do you want to get your information from? What, don't you think practicing dentists like yourself? What? Well, YouTube. You can go on YouTube. That, that's right. <laughs> and, and, you know, of, course, of course, not just pharma docs, because yeah. we're going we're gonna to tear apart what's coming out every single month. Yeah. But gosh, why would you go attend a lecture when you got pharma dent? All right. Exactly. S- seriously. I mean, I wouldn't go do it. I, I mean, it, it costs you $99. Mm-hmm. You get almost eight hours of CE and you get every single medication category there is. All right. Wow. I mean, that's a bargain. I, that's like $10 an hour for CE. And, yeah. And, and guess what else? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> and what else is behind door number two, you know, but anyway, yeah. um, yeah, you get to review it all year long. Mm-hmm. And not only that, we talk about medically compromised patients because, hey, you and I treat medically compromised patients every day. Oh, all yeah. right. So yeah. we're sharing that knowledge with all of our uh, practitioners out there as well, too. I, I I just don't know why you would spend that kind of money to go to a lecture and maybe get mm-hmm. one category for a medication. So yeah. I don't know. Well, let's, let's get going. Let's for, get going. Uh, today. All right. So uh, today is November 10th. 10th, and yes. So this is our, as you said, the 11th installment of uh, PharmaDocs for uh, 2023. And um, so we first want, before we get into it, we want, of course, want to thank our sponsors, iCore yes. RX, uh, yes. which is an online e prescribing system that you can use from your office computer, your home computer, and even your iPhone. That's so you right. can connect from any device. And it works uh, quite well. And then the Fortune Law Firm, who uh, basically um, is there for you, not, you know, is is a law firm, not for liability or malpractice issues, but to help you make money and keep the money that you earn in your practice, as well as how to avoid- Protect your assets. Yeah, exactly. Protect your assets. And license protection protection mm-hmm. and jay can't yeah. say enough about the vesper institute as mm-hmm. well i no, mean that's vesper institute Woo-hoo. how do you like that i love it and uh i mean should have worn my vesper hat tonight truly the med midwest center for dental education mm-hmm. okay yeah some right. fantastic courses there um for dentists for hygienists for assistants and uh, you can find everything they offer at vesperinstitute.com. Although I look today, they don't have a 2024 schedule up yet. Uh, it'll be soon. I mean, but yeah. I'll tell you, um, the founder of Vesper, he is a visionary and uh, it, it's happening. And like Jay said, great courses out there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we, we, we just did our advanced emergencies course out there. What a success mm-hmm. that was. Yeah. Yeah. It was really good. Well, anyway, so let's uh, let's get moving. Let's go. Uh, a couple of things in the news. In the news. And um, why don't you go ahead and talk about those? Well, you know, first of all, Jay, that made the news again, we keep talking about, you know, how many states have legalized cannabis now. I believe it's 40. Arizona just, yeah, Arizona yeah. just did. I, saw, I mean, um, Ohio, I just saw that on my news feed. So marijuana can definitely raise the odds for heart attack as well as heart failure. Yeah. And uh, in, in this study, Jay, um, it showed that. Patients that use cannabis had an increased risk of heart attack or stroke by 20%. Yeah. Okay. And heart failure by 34%. I mean, you have to keep in mind, yeah. uh, this was 29,000 uh, regular marijuana users, but they're all over the age of 65 and all in the hospital. So it's kind of a skewed population. But in general, everything that we 
uh, know that we're discovering as uh, cannabis has become legal in most states. Right. Is it causes all kinds of issues for us. It's, you know, sure especially does. when we come to anesthesia and pain management after procedures, um, you know, they require a lot more anesthetic. Um, it's a much rockier anesthetic. It's not as right. smooth. No. They require more pain medications afterwards, even though you think, oh, you know, uh, I smoke pot for pain or yeah. it actually increases their sensitivity to pain and they need more uh, pain medication in the post-op period. But, but Jay, think, think about this study also. I mean, you're, you're talking about older than 65. All yeah. these people are going to go to a dentist as well, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. So what, what if they've already had a heart attack, but they continue to smoke marijuana mm -hmm. and then they come into your office and it's been, say, three or four months. <laughs> are you going to treat that patient? I'm not. No, because <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm wait, wait at least six months. And I'm going to do it with very light blood. sedation. So they're not stressed. But. If you add in this study as well, too, that helps to skew matters as well. It, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. simply because of the fact of 20% heart attack, 34% mm -hmm. heart failure. Yeah. And keep in uh, mind that patient red flag, period. Uh, yeah. Keep in mind patients or people over the age of 12, 12. Yes. Uh, marijuana or cannabis products are the number one abused uh, substances in the, right. in the United States. Yeah, it's right. amazing. And, you know, people say, oh, it's natural. It's good for you. Well, you know, so is atropine. That's natural. And that can speed up your heart like crazy. Uh, cocaine, digitalis, um, ephedrine, physostigmine, karari, morphine. Those are all natural too, derived directly from plants. And that doesn't mean they don't have any side effects, untoward That's effects. Right. So, Jay, and, t tell us about your favorite jack inhibitors. You always seem to have something about the jack inhibitors. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say um, <coughs> a good rule of thumb is uh, that I heard somewhere is never breathe in air that you can see. Okay. <laughs> so keep that in mind. It's hey, not, I like it's that. I, I, yeah. It's just like our, our rule of thumb with infection. Never let the mm -hmm. sun set on pus, right? That's you, right. You, you won't get yourself in trouble. I'm just telling you. Yep. Heal with steel. Um, so there's a new study that was uh, came out in uh, Japan. Right. Looking at adults with rheumatoid arthritis, and in all the clinical studies, showed that the JAK inhibitors, or Janus kinase inhibitors, um, seem to be pretty effective in all these studies. But these are all controlled clinical studies, and nothing has really been done in real life. And so, with this um, study from Japan, found it was published uh, November 1st in the journal Rheumatology, is that how many patients did they do? 622 patients yeah. with rheumatoid yeah. arthritis. Uh, and it didn't matter which jack inhibitor they took. Um, there were four different ones that they, uh, they all evaluated. Worked. They all worked. They all yeah. worked in the real world. So it's not just a, you know, a clinical trial. It works. Jack inhibitors definitely do work for rheumatoid arthritis. So let's move on to our drugs. Now we've got a lot hey, of drugs to cover. Guess what? I mean, uh, is that anything? out of the norm. I mean, yeah. it's, it's every month. So like you said, we're on our 11th installment yeah. right now. We've covered 10 months of mm -hmm. drugs. Yeah. Um, there, there's been over a hundred drugs approved this year. All yeah. Right? And I think we have 10, there were what, 12 or 13 drugs this month. We're, we're going to not talk left, about three of them. Yeah. We left some um, of them out we're gonna get, because they're not all that relevant to dentistry. So no. we're just concentrating on the ones that are, that you may see, in your practice on a fairly regular basis. And oh, the first you, one you, is Velsipity. No, 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 no. You, you will see these in your practice mm -hmm. and you will have to adjust your treatment of your patients, period. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Velsipity or... Tell us about Velsipity. Yes. So looking by at the name, I-M-O-D-I-M-O-D, it's, yeah. it's a uh, receptor modulator. modulator. And this is a yep. sphingosine 1-phosphate, S1P receptor modulator, that's indicated for the treatment of moderately to severe active ulcerative colitis in adults. Yes. And why isn't this slide advancing? I see a slide that has advanced. There we go. There okay. We go, right there. So um, the thing that is unique about uh, this drug is that it uh, acts on, and you can see it's up there in the middle there, the three. Yeah. Um, it acts on S1... Uh, uh, S1P, R1, R4, and R5 uh, receptors, but doesn't 
do anything to the R2 and R3. And the uh, S1P, S1P R1 is the most important for what it does to um, treat ulcerative colitis because it modulates um, lymphocyte um, trafficking, um, T cell regulation and promotion of uh, tumor growth and other factors that will calm down ulcerative colitis, which as we know, is a, it's a chronic inflammatory bowel disease right. that, um, well, actually, uh, so it, since, uh, the, uh, S1P, uh, recept receptor subtype one, uh, inhibits specific subset of activated lymphocytes from migrating to sites of inflammation. So the exact way that it works, uh, isn't really known, but it's thought to involve reduction of lymphocyte migration into the uh, intestines, intestines and, that's right. and creating an inflammatory uh, process, so or autoimmune process. So, um, some of the can I go back? Okay, so those are the receptors we talked about those already. So it selectively binds to the S one C S one P sub uh, receptor subtype one. Oh, I just said that. Okay. You, you've done that. that. There we go. Now yeah. we get into the warnings. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, it basically is indicated in patients who've had previously failed or were intolerant to at least one of the conventional medications or biologics or to Janus kinase inhibitors, yes. uh, which are some therapy that's uh, done first line. And it showed a clinical remission of 27% for patients at 12 weeks yep. and 32% um, at 52 weeks compared to placebo. So it was uh, very effective and it's given by a pill. So it's not an injection. It's an oral medication. It's given daily and oops, go back. So the warnings with this drug are that, um, well, why don't you talk about that? Well, no, no, I was just going to say, Jay, as everybody can read these warnings right here, you yeah. know, and the increased risk of infections, because yeah. that's something we have been preaching for years on yeah. PharmaDocs with uh, if you've got any type of immunomodulator drug right. or if you've got yeah. immunosuppressant drug, IMAB, right. UMAB, uh, and we're going to talk we about have. some of those again yeah. here in mm -hmm. just a minute, or just the JAK inhibitors. Yeah. You're they going all, to anything have, that interferes. Exactly. It, that's right. You're going to have to, so you got an increased risk of infections. You got bradyarrhythmias or, uh, a, a, a atrial ventricular conduction, uh, conduction delays, delays. Yeah. Which, which makes me concerned if anybody's doing IV sedation and they're on this drug, could you yeah. see some type of bradycardia yeah. associated with this? Yeah. Okay. And it can also cause right. a decline in their pulmonary function. Right. Uh, that could be a problem during sedation too. Yes. And the effects will last for about five weeks after their last dose. So, so, uh, so there, there we so are at the very bottom of the slide, Jay, talking about what we talk about. Immunosuppressive yeah. drugs, immunomodulating drugs. So their immune system is going to be affected mm -hmm. for up to five weeks after the last dose. Yeah. Yeah. So and you, you may not think it's a big deal. They come into your office with a hot tooth. Yeah, let's mm -hmm. go ahead and get it out. Well, yeah. they just finished Velsipity last week. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, or they're no, or they're taking it daily. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No need to uh, give an antibiotic. Then all of a sudden yeah. you you get a rip roaring infection with yeah. this. Okay. All right. Yeah. You so, got so look to look out. at these medications. All That's these right. That's right. All these immunosuppressive drugs, which That's we've right. said over and over again, but hopefully uh, <laughs> everyone will remember that. Well, so, we're going to keep saying it. So, John, why do we want to be aware of uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, which are, are both inflammatory bowel diseases? Um, what, you know, what's, what's up with these? Why do well, we have to know about them? Well, well, we're always concerned also about, you know, any colorectal issues as well, well too. How yeah. it could progress into something much more significant. Yeah, and about 1.6 million Americans um, have some type of inflammatory bowel disease. Yes. And this is uh, a lot of times diagnosed before the age of 35. And it's another yeah. you know, autoimmune disorder we got to worry yeah. about. And the long-term effects of this are can be pretty significant if, if this infection is not controlled, inflammation is not controlled. So ulcerative colitis is a little different from Crohn's disease, even though they're both classified as um, inflammatory bowel disease. Correct. Ulcerative colitis will affect the entire uh, large intestine, the entire colon. And you see things like loss of the haustra, which are the basically the folds in, in the large intestine. 
Right. And of course, when you lose and, and those folds are due to muscles in the, and so you lose um, motility through the colon and it can actually lead to uh, colon cancer as well as, um, you know, different um, abscesses that can form in the GI right. tract, which, um, or in the colon, which will basically rupture into the abdomen, um, which can be Jay, very serious. Do, do we know a percentage of UC or Crohn's disease that can migrate or progress into colorectal cancer? No, maybe I, you, I, I no, I, I couldn't find okay. a percentage on that. No. Oh, okay. I thought that was a leading question. No. So, um, I, I would never then, do that to you. And then Crohn's disease is a little different and it can affect not just the large intestine, but any part of the digestive tract right. from the mouth to, an to the anus. So you can see lesions on the soft palate, on the hard palate, ulcerations, um, on the tongue, you get ulcerations in the esophagus and the stomach. And the characteristic look of this went on colonoscopy is what's called the cobblestone effect. So when you look in an endoscope into the intestine, rather than it being kind of, you see the folds, uh, it looks like a cobblestone street. Yes. So yeah. it's, it's uh, very interesting. And so this can also lead to strictures and which, which, which leads to obst obstructions as well. Yeah. Too. And you can so, get, I mean, that's, uh, that's an issue. Yeah. And the fistula again can drain into, um, well, basically anything that's around it. So places where there's not supposed to be a connection between the colon, such as uh, the GU tract, um, even you know, even the abdomen, and so or bladder. So right. um, you got you know this is a is this a, a disease that really needs to be treated, or there can be some very significant long term effects. And like we mentioned, it it affects 1.6 million people, or probably more. In, in the U.S. All right. So the next drug just so happens to be another new drug for yes. treating Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And Pharma Nation, I, this may wind up being the majority of our medications this week talking about this disease state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite, quite Actually, a few approved five, for it. There are four or five drugs we're going to yes. talk about for yes. uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So this is a different mechanism. Yeah. So instead of an S1P modulator like velcipity, this yep. is a TNF alpha blocker that's used for maintenance treatment in UC and, and Crohn's disease in adults. And uh, it and, works. And it's, an, it's, an, it's an IMAB as well too, Jim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it works basically by um, inhibiting uh, uh, TNF alpha which causes all kinds of, uh, which is overproduced with a lot of different conditions, medications, yes. diseases. And when the TNF alpha is overproduced, it can cause the immune system to attack normal, healthy parts of the body. And so this works by um, reducing uh, the effects of TNF alpha uh, so that you don't get that massive inflammation, um, autoimmune uh, response. And this is this is actually the same drug as another drug from the same company from uh, Celatron, uh, known as uh, where, let's see, where are we go? Oh, okay, known as uh, well, actually it's also called uh, infliximab, uh, which is an which is an IV form, and the infliximab. Yeah. Uh, dash D Y Y B otherwise known as inflectra is a biosimilar of, of, um, uh, Remicade. So Remicade is just plain old, inf uh, inflimizab, but this, um, the, uh, inflectra is a biosimilar. That's why it has that suffix D Y Y B. And you'll notice right. that we go back for a second that Zym, um, Zymphentra also has the same suffix. So it's the identical drug, but it's been formulated so it can be given subcutaneously rather than intravenously like uh, Inflectra and Remicade. And they're looking at it for not only treating ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's, but also in uh, pediatric patients, um, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing uh, spondylitis, arth uh, psoriatic arthritis, and plaque psoriasis, which we're gonna, which we're gonna mention later. 
Yep. And uh, so the studies basically have shown superiority of this drug uh, in a 54 week study. And so the induction therapy is with the intravenous version of this drug. And then this is just sort of maintenance therapy is subcutaneous. And of yeah. course, you know, what are the side effects that we need to be aware of uh, for these, this type of drug? Infections, right? Also increases the risk of congestive heart failure um, and uh, uh, can cause all kinds of other side effects like anemia, arthralgias, um, abdominal pain. Uh, it can actually increase the risk of COVID-19 in patients. So all these drugs, these immune modulating drugs, these uh, monoclonal antibodies um, are really good, but there are so many side effects of, of all these drugs. So, John, why don't you talk about the next one? Well, guess what? This is uh, also to be used for uh, UC or ulcerative mm -hmm. colitis, but mm -hmm. uh, this is also designated for moderate to severely active UC mm -hmm. in patients. And this is called OMVO. Yeah. And uh, Miracuzumab. And yep. so, so it's a human again, monoclonal antibody. It's a human monoclonal antibody. And uh, it specifically works at the interleukin 23 antagonist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now, it's an antagonist to interleukin 23. And right. you may be asking, what's interleukin 23? Well, <laughs> it's you can one see of them. that in the center of our yeah. diagram yeah. right it's there. It's one That's of the. Many inflammatory mediators that are involved in all kinds of inflammatory diseases. And yes. so what um, interleukin-23 does is that it essentially um, increases in inflammation. Over so overactivation of, of interleukin-23 um, is one of the things that causes the, inf or thought to cause the inflammation in ulcerative colitis. So if you look at all the, the four different colored receptors on there, the indigo, the, the blue, the green, the orange, mm -hmm. you can see that blue circle that has mm -hmm. adapted into that receptor site. That's mm -hmm. the IL-23, and that's triggering mm -hmm. everything down the bottom. So yeah. as Jay said, chronic inflammation and tissue damage, but it leads to so many different disease states, yeah. psoriasis, uh, MS, RA, Crohn's, mm -hmm. UC, and uh, AS as well, too. So yeah. inter interleukin-23, is a, he, they, the, it's a bad player. Yeah. And so what this drug does is it targets the P19 subunit yeah. of the interleukin-23. So it interrupts the pathway. So it, it's, pathway. It, it's like a reversing of a sedation a, drug. Okay. So it's an antagonist to this that. guy right here. That little. Yeah. Can you see, can you see my arrow by the way? I cannot. Oh, okay. Only I can. All right. Then never yeah. mind. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's that, that little uh, uh, subunit off of the, uh, on the IL, uh, IL 23 R that's yep. inhibited. So yep. with this drug, after, uh, 12 weeks of treatment, um, nearly two thirds of patients achieve clinical response and nearly one fourth, uh, 24% achieve clinical remission compared, compared to placebo. So that's, and, that's pretty impressive. But, but Jay, guess what? Uh, again, in the warnings, what, what do we have another increase for, um, oh. infections? Yeah, everybody okay. out there should be able to guess. In fact, exactly, infections, yeah. especially uh, also upper respiratory infections. So, of course, you're not going to want to sedate someone that um, has an upper respiratory infection Correct. from one of these drugs. And uh, you know, there, there's also there's an induction period uh, where they start them on IV, and then it goes to a subcutaneous maintenance phase. Right. And uh, in the maintenance phase, um, the same side effects, but you can also get Patients also get rash and headaches. So um, another drug to be aware of is Weslana, Weslana. which, as you can see, is another human auto, uh, um, uh, on, monoclonal. Antibody. My brain is brain is blank. My that's okay. My brain is blanking. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> Another these, monoclonal, uh, the, these human monoclonal generic antibody. These generic names can get to us. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is, um, you know, we just mentioned a drug that works on interleukin-23. Yes. This also works on interleukin-12 12, 12. in addition and to 23. And it's biosimilar to Stellara, 
which has been used to treat plaque psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So here we can see that it uh, basically inhibits two different uh, interleukin receptors, IL-23 right. and IL-12, oh. which um, are, you know, basically both are involved in creating the inflammatory, oh, <laughs> Wrong page. The inflammatory uh, response and, that we see in ulcerative colitis and, yes. and Crohn's disease. All right. So now we're going to move on to another human monoclonal antibody. And so this is Bimzalex. Yeah. Amazing. Bimzalex. Huh? Yeah. Yep. So, so, so to the audience, we just went through four drugs that got approved in the this last month. month. This, that last month mm -hmm. for ulcerative colitis. And yeah. note, there were four different companies. Yeah. And four different mechanisms. Four different mechanisms. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And here we have another drug that um, that antagonizes interleukin 17A and 17F. Yes. And this is used for a different disorder. Yep. Um, which is another, anti, uh, another autoimmune inflammatory disease uh, known as psoriasis. And, and we and, just talked about that with the IL-23 antagonist yeah, as well, mm -hmm. too. It's being tried for right. that. So, again, this is another drug for um, autoimmune disorder causing right. uh, mostly is mostly indicated for psoriasis. And it's for patients who basically were our candidates for systemic therapy or phototherapy because topical therapy is not working for them. Right. And you can see this a lot. I don't know if you can read this, but for mild uh, cases of psoriasis, usually the treatment is topicals and sometimes phototherapy. As it gets more severe, phototherapy is one of the, the mainstays, as well as stronger, uh, even systemic corticosteroids. Right. Um, and then you get down on the bottom right to biologic th therapy, anti-TNF and anti-interleukin medications. And that's where uh, this one uh, falls into the scheme of things. So psoriasis is an immune-mediated inflammatory condition yep. um, where you get basically inflammation in the basal layer of the skin, which creates um, ker uh, keratinocytes to hyperproliferate, and it creates these hyperkeratotic silvery, silvery scales that are very thick and can come off, leaving a very inflamed um uh, base underneath of the of the of the epidermis, and you can even you can even see uh, bleeding spots, and this is all T cell mediated, and so uh, again, this drug acts in the interleukin 17 A and F mechanism, and this is what plaque psoriasis looks like. Now, yep. not every patient looks like this. This is a pretty severe case, but you can yes. see, um, you know, these huge red patches with all these hyperkeratotic plaques and they're, they're raised, they're not flat. Um, and of course, you know, not only are these painful and th can, they can restrict patient's activity and they can have a, a psoriatic arthritis as a component of this. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it can affect, uh, the patient's social interactions because of the way that they look with these lesions all over their skin. And so having an effective medication to treat plaque psoriasis is, is really, um, you know, a big breakthrough. Right. And so, um, again, you know, chronically, uh, immune mediated and it works by selectively and directly inhibiting IL 17 a and IL 17 F, which are two of the key cytokines that drive the inflammatory process. And this is given, um, subcutaneously, um, at zero, four, eight, 12, and then 16 weeks. And then every eight weeks thereafter. And, and, and it had real, it had real good results too. Yeah. Yeah. The results, um, are, let's see, what are, what do they say? Oh, I actually, actually, I don't have the results of that. Um, do you have stats on how well it worked? Well, the, well, they, they took it from their phase three and it did so well that they went ahead and approved it to, uh, -huh. uh, uh uh, to, to where it is now. Yeah. So you can see where I, I um, circle interleukin 17 A and F. So that's where this works. And so um, you can also see that uh, at the bottom, that box down there, uh, that uh, 
Bima, Bima Kuz, you, yeah, you, you Mab, um, is in that box, and that affects directly <laughs> interleukin 17 A and F. So, so Jay, they, they, they said that patients approved superiorly by mm-hmm. week 16. That's why I got approved. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's, that's the, the, great. The previous picture, you know, if, if one person is at a small plaque compared to what that was, that's mm-hmm. significant results for him or her. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it can be a really debilitating disease. Um, I had psoriasis growing up and somehow I outgrew it. Wow. I, had pla- I had plaques, not, you know, like, uh, uh, black psoriasis, but I had them in more, I, I had scalp lesions. I had, uh, groin lesions. I have axillary lesions and it was, it was difficult. And I got all kinds, you know, topical steroids, systemic steroids, steroid injections, um, I was using tar shampoo and it just seemed to go away over time, which is very unusual. Yeah. So I feel, I feel very lucky that it didn't get so, worse. So the warnings again, increased infections here, uh, mm-hmm. actually suicidal tendencies. Yeah. That's, well. that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, and uh, but, upper respiratory tract infections, oral mm-hmm. candidiasis. So that's mm-hmm. where, uh, um, two things. One, if you're doing IV sedation, you gotta be concerned about that. And then just, if you're not, just being a, a general dentist or a, mm-hmm. a, a specialist, when you see oral candidiasis, you can treat that. Yeah. And if you see that they're on one of these monoclonal antibodies, that might explain why they have the candidiasis. Correct. So again, we talked about the precautions with this. Um, some of the more common adverse reactions, though, are like respiratory infections, coral candidiasis. You mentioned also a headache um, and tinea infections, which are basically like... Um, any corpus like a uh, ringworm or um, uh, uh, athlete's foot, uh, acne, folliculitis, other candidal infections, and, and fatigue. So now let's move on to a drug that is more into our realm. And this is a uh, combogesic IV, which is a combination of acetaminophen and ibuprofen. But this is an IV formulation that is used for management of post-operative pain. And there we go. Mm -hmm. It's got a thousand milligrams of acetaminophen Mm -hmm. and 300 milligrams of ibuprofen. Yeah. You know, I would have loved to seen that to have 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. Yeah. It would be, or at least 400. It would be a little bit more effective, but, um, you know, studies show that this works and actually reduces, uh, the patient's need for, uh, opioid analgesics. Um, but it's basically, it's not really practical for a dental office, even when you're doing IV sedation. Um, it's given by a 15 minute, minute infusion every six hours. So if the patient's inpatient, then that makes some sense. But if you're doing outpatient surgery or outpatient dentistry under sedation, um, you know, probably better to have them take oral um, acetaminophen and ibuprofen postoperatively. It's going to be a lot more effective. Yeah. Uh, and, and eventually, Jay, I think they'll get to where we will have an indication for in our office. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe know, give it, it as uh, like as soon as you're done with the with procedure, giving it yeah. to them or even bef- yeah. at the beginning of the procedure. Uh, yeah, go ahead and put it in your IV fluid bags. Now, this drug, Jay, outside of America... Mm-hmm. It's already been approved, but it's yeah, in like 20, con- 20 countries, it, right? It, it, or over Ma- 40 countries. It's and called it's been Max, Max, in 100. Maxagesic. Yeah. yeah. But of course, here in the US, we have to have our own name for it. That, that, that's uh, right. But it, it has been approved. And of course, Maxagesic is ibuprofen with paracetamol. Yes. Which is what they uh, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, what they call acetaminophen. On the other side of the pond, they call it. On the other side of the pond. That's yep. right. Yep. So, um, with have you, have this you ever drug... lectured over the, over the pond? No, no. Mm-mm. Maybe we'll get Haven't asked, come, maybe we'll get asked by the British dental association to come over and talk or something like that. I, maybe, maybe, that, that, maybe, that, maybe that, some, maybe someone uh, across the pond is watching our webcast tonight. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, like, so it's been FDA approved and the yes. phase three program showed that it was well tolerated and actually had a faster onset of action than either uh, IV ibuprofen or acetaminophen alone. And as I mentioned, it it also reduces the use of opioids in the post-op period. Absolutely, it does. 
So, and I mentioned it's, uh, it's a 15 minute infusion uh, every six hours. So in the outpatient setting, it's probably not, um, you know, a f not, uh, does not really practical to use. Right. All right. We're moving right through all these drugs. So next one is Cetuvio. Cetagliptin. Yep. And, and uh, type 2 diabetes. You know, Jay, yeah. uh, before we start talking about all of this, you know, um, the, the big thing we've been talking about is Ozempic, mm -hmm. semaglutide, mm -hmm. and the, a new drug just got approved uh, yesterday called Zepbound. Uh huh. Wow. And fancy um, names. Yeah. And it's a uh, Tirzepatide is uh -huh. the uh, generic name. Uh -huh. Now it's known for diabetes as Mongero. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. But it's the same exact drug, but this is going to be for weight loss. Okay. And it's so this, called, yeah, this and same Zetovio drug is going to be called for glycemic, Z glycemic control. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be called Zepbound for weight loss. And you've got to have a parameter of a BMI of 27 or greater plus okay. one disease state okay. like hypertension, diabetes, yeah. high triglycerides, high cholesterol. Okay. Those are the criteria right there. Okay. So, you know, you know, with type two diabetes, um, Insulin is being secreted, but it's either yep. an inadequate amount or uh, the cells are actually resistant, resistant to, to, it, that's right. to the insulin. And so the doesn't bring glucose into the cells. And so where does the glucose remain? In the blood, right? Blood. And, the, and the levels increase. That's right. Yeah. And so um, what this drug does is another uh, DPP-4 inhibitor, uh, and it inhibits... Uh, GLP-1 and GLP-1 uh, basically uh, is a drug that promotes uh, or actually inhibits the breakdown of GLP-1 and GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic and Trulicity yeah. um, result in more insulin uh, being secreted, less glucagon, glucagon being secreted, and it delays gastric emptying, which will reduce the absorption the, of, uh, of glucose, of sugar, carbohydrates from the foods that we're eating and results in a lower blood glucose uh, overall. But again, you know, look at that box up above. What's the third thing down there? Number three, yeah. insulin, glucagon, and what? And reduced gastric emptying, yes. decreased gastric motility. And so why do we need to be aware of that? Well, we're, we're gonna let's be say, well, if we're let's, doing let's say we're doing IV sedation or even could, nitrous oxide. Yeah, I mean, patients. you could you could have still gastric contents that pose the possibility of a passive regurgitation episode yeah. in your office. Now you may have aspiration as well, too. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, studies are showing, and this is becoming coming more and more common. And uh, we're seeing in the anesthesia literature and also in the oral surgery literature, is that there have been patients who were NPO for days that were on, especially GLP one inhibitors, that had a full stomach. It just, you know, most well, or mostly full stomach. The food yes. just didn't pass through, and so you've got now they're saying. Patients have to be off of these medications for at least five days before they have sedation. And same thing goes, I think, for nitrous oxide, because if they've yes. got all this food in their stomach uh, that's not digested, that there's also the risk of emesis and vomiting. So you just want to be careful and protect yourself. So type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, of course, are not the same thing. Not the um, same. Yeah. So with type one, you're not producing enough insulin. And in type two, you're not really getting a response. You get resistance. Insulin. Resistance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you can have type two for type one diabetics. Of course, insulin is one of the uh, medications that are the mainstay. But patients with type two diabetes can also include or can also require insulin. If, yes. if the oral hypoglycemics or these newer medications are not working for them. The symptoms are basically the same. And as we know, type one generally occurs in younger patients, type two, generally older patients who are overweight. 
but those rules are not hard and fast. They aren't. Yeah, there are plenty of exceptions. Okay, so what causes type 2 diabetes? I think we're all pretty familiar with. Um, hypertension is one of the uh, risk factors. Uh, pancreatic disease, obesity, obesity is another big one. Um, as you get older, age increases, genetic predisposition. Uh, stress will increase the risk. Um, sedentary lifestyle, unhealthy food, so and different medications. So movement, exercise, you know, not eating as many donuts and chocolate and ice cream sandwiches or ice cream bars, <laughs> which are things that I love, um, you know, is uh, is very important for patients who develop type 2 diabetes to modify right. their activity, increase their activity, and really uh, concentrate on what goes into their body. And, 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 you know, Jay, we just talked about this last month. Um, you know, obesity just hit 40% of the American population. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So and, and that's, and that's a BMI over, was a three point 30. Oh, or, I mean, yeah. 30. Yeah. 30. Yeah. Yeah. Which is high. So it, it is high. And, uh, so you're going to see more and more diabetes, hypertension. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah. as we, we talked about in our medically compromised, uh, disease lecture this you know obesity is a, a red flag that walks into your office yeah yeah i had a patient come in today 40 years old smoker uh severely retroanathic overweight and you know of course you know he came in for a root canal lower molar that's infected and of course he wants to be sedated so this is you know patient with a lot of red flags that i'm right. going to sedate lightly <laughs> yeah uh, just to keep them comfortable I'm not going to take any chances with this guy and his airway and, and, uh, I uh, want to make sure it's safe for him and also, um, not as stressful for me. Oh yeah. No. Cause, uh, you know, as, as I'm getting older, like I mentioned, I, I don't want as much stress in my life. All right. So the next drug is, la, uh, Loctorzy, lo which lo is another, Torsi. Another monoclonal antibody, but this is an IMAB, IMAB. So I believe it comes from derived from mice, right? Yes. Is it mice? Okay. And so this has, of course, a different mechanism. Um, it, it targets the program death or PD1 receptors. And this is for a disease that we may very well be the ones diagnosing in our practices. And that's nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Jay, I had a case like this one time. Um, a dentist tried to get a tooth out and just could not get the patient numb. Mm -hmm. And then when they came to our office, you know, um, of course, we put the patient to sleep. But then uh, buckle to number 15, the entire vestibular area was completely swollen, hard. Uh -huh. Yeah. Removed the tooth. And a lot of disease tissue all in the sinus. Okay? Yeah. Did, did you have any and, airway issues and, with the patient? Uh, no, no airway issues at all. Okay. And uh, it was diagnosed as nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, you know, this disease is usually treated by either surgery. Uh, actually, not by surgery. Surgery is kind of the last resort because it's a pretty difficult nasty surgery. Yes. I mean, yeah, they basically have to remove part of the maxilla and a big facial flap to get to it. Yes. So the mainstay of treatment is chemotherapy and radiation. I actually had a patient I saw today for consultation um, for uh, removing a tooth. Um, told her, we're, and she wanted an implant. And I said, that's not a good idea. The tooth is infected, abscess, we have to get it out. But I would not recommend doing uh, uh, an implant given her history of radiation and chemotherapy. Yes. So again, um, this drug basically is an inhibitor of uh, PD, uh, PD-L1 and L2 receptors, uh, which reduce, which inhibits the growth of the tumor cells. So, hey, you know, Jay, Jay let, let, let me just mention, this is a oh. first-in-line class drug as well, mm -hmm. too. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the significance of this as well, because who knows, maybe in, in the future, given this drug, th this kind of radical surgery will not be needed. Um, yeah, yeah, with may, this maybe, drug. Yes, yeah, right. It might be able to eradicate the cancer altogether. Yeah, it, by enabling the immune system to basically um, activate and kill the tumor. And so nasopharyngeal carcinoma can start, basically, it starts in the nasopharynx. That's why it's yes. divide, uh, uh, called nasopharyngeal carcinoma. But 
they can get pretty big. So it's the most common cancer that originates in the nasopharynx. And it's usually um, in a recess known as the fossa of Rosenmuller, which is not kind of in the middle, but off to the side on either side. Yes. And half the cases actually occur, uh, or 50% of the cases are in this area. And uh, this can occur not only in adults, but also in children. And it's significantly different from other cancers of the head and neck uh, because of its occurrence, its causes, clinical behavior, and treatment. And um, we were taught, and this still holds true, that it's much more common in East Asia and Africa than anywhere else. And it has to do with um, viral factors, um, dietary, genetic factors, and also smoking. Um, it's a it's squamous cell carcinoma that's of an undifferentiated type, and it's more common in men. And it'll present as a lump or a mass on both sides of the neck um, that are usually not tender. Of course, when you have enlarged lymph nodes in the neck in the neck that are not tender, that's always a bad sign. And it's due to basically swelling in the lymph nodes, which inhibits uh, lymphatic drainage. And the kinds of symptoms the patient can have are things like sore throat, headaches. Um, it can block the eustachian tube and interfere with hearing. Um, patient, all the hearing sounds stuffy. It can interfere with the patient's airway, um, with their swallowing if it gets big enough, and speaking because it, it obstructs their throat uh, right. partially. If it gets uh, later stages, facial pain or numbness because it inver involves uh, in, it invades into uh, the peripheral nerves, uh, a fifth peripheral nerve, seventh peripheral nerve, cause double vision, trismus, of course, uh, yep. if it, once it infiltrates the muscles. Um, one thing that is, um, is kind of a red flag is if you have an adult that's getting recurrent ear infections, because normally ear infections in kids are kind of a normal thing. But if you have a recurrent ear infection in an adult, it's usually due to a nasopharyngeal carcinoma that's obstructing the eustachian tube and yes. causing, resulting in uh, otitis media. And of course, uh, that, it, that, that, that's a great tidbit right there. Yeah. So the risk factors I mentioned are Chinese or Asian ancestry. And then exposure to Epstein var virus seems to be um, uh, pre prevalent in a lot of patients that have. This diagnosis it doesn't mean that if you have Epstein Barr uh, bar virus um, in your system that you're going to de develop nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Correct. But in patients that do, uh, I think like 95% of them uh, test positive for EBV. And smoking, as I mentioned, um, is a one of the risk factors for not only oral carcinoma but also nasopharyngeal. And if you combine that with heavy alcohol consumption, of course. Uh, that increases uh, the risk exponentially, both for oral and nasopharyngeal cancer. So treatment, John, you want to cover those things? Oh, yeah. I mean, bottom line, if initially, I mean, the surgery is so radical, they try to first do radiation and chemotherapy. Yeah. And then uh, immunotherapy as well, but surgery is the last resort. So now with this drug, um, this is something new. Like I said, mm -hmm. it's a first in class drug It's yeah. now going to give radiation oncologists and hematologists an opportunity to treat this. And yeah. Another great tool. Yeah. And it's actually been shown yeah. that if it's used in conjunction with, uh, key other chemotherapeutic Chemo, agents, right. which are, you know, cisplatinum and, and, uh, similar agents that, um, it reduced the risk of a disease progression or death by 48% uh, compared with chemotherapy and alone. And so that's, uh, that's pretty significant. That's right. And so this is what nasopharyngeal carcinoma looks like. Um, you can see, uh, the lumps in the neck are a late presentation of a more advanced disease. Um, you can look at the CT scans and see where the masses are. You, you got um, your pointer I, to show everybody. I wish I could show with my point. I wish I had a pointer, but in a, you can see that it's basically on the right side of the posterior of the nasopharynx. Um, in B, I'm sorry, C down below, you have a bigger mass and in C it's an even bigger mass. 
Um, and you can see here, it's very close to the eustachian tube. And then the different stages depend on the size. Uh, stage one is relatively small and localized. Stage two is more of a uh, kind of a regional enlargement. Um, stage three also is, uh, is kind of a, a regional uh, enlargement of the tumor. And stage four, of course, is when you have metastatic disease or distance disease. And so the the five-year survival will depend on how severe the disease is at diagnosis. So if it's diagnosed and treated uh, when it's localized, like stage one or even stage two, about an 82% uh, five-year survival. When it's stage three, it goes down to 72%. And if you've got metastatic disease stage four, um, you're down to 49% five-year survival. All right, how are we doing time-wise? Man, I think we're doing good. I mean, we're, we we still got our medical emergency to do. I, I think yeah. we're okay. Uh, All we'll right, so we'll, we'll skim we'll through these real, a little quicker. Yeah, we'll yeah. just read. Yeah. So this yeah. is amigri, uh, a gamma, a camry, or vamo or alone, which the which means last you know, alone means it's a corticosteroid. Correct. And this is treated, uh, indicated for the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy in. <laughs> Uh, patients two and older. And so Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, is basically um, a uh, autoimmune disease. It's uh, anti-inflammatory or yep. it's inflammatory and uh, autoimmune, which results in destruction, destruction of the neuromuscular junction, causing progressive muscle weakness, fatigue, difficulty walking, climbing upstairs, falls, developmental delays, respiratory issues, uh, speech and language problems, uh, scoliosis. So be, be careful putting these patients to sleep. Yeah. Very careful. Yeah. In fact, this is a patient I would probably do in the hospital. Correct. Intubate. Yeah. And so the this is a, a new type of corticosteroid. It's kind of a unique corticosteroid that acts a little differently. Um, it and in the study that it in their phase two studies, um, it showed comparable efficacy in let's see adverse effects. But um, let's see, I think it was just it went by a different mechanism. And okay, so it was compare it was comparable to other corticosteroids, but didn't have as many adverse side effects. Right. Okay. Um, and this is an oral suspension that's given once a day which when you have a patient with muscular dystrophy, they may have swallowing difficulty or they may even have to have a, um, a, uh, either a um, uh, percutaneous gastric tube, uh, uh, tube fed. And so it can be given through the, through the tube that way or through a naso uh, NG tube, nasogastric yep. tube. Yep. Okay. All right. So that, Oh, there's well, another yeah, drug. We got, we got oh, one I missed more. one. Yeah. Okay. Zyluc Zylucoplan, uh, yeah. also known as Zilbrisk. Okay. And uh, that's a peptide inhibitor of the uh, C5 inhibitor for, for myasthenia graft. Yeah, another okay. autoimmune muscular another. disorder. You see this more in uh, in adults. Right. But uh, with myasthenia gravis, you basically get uh, what's happening is that um, uh, the it's a uh, immunoglobulin, uh, I am, it's a, let's see, IgG antibody IgG, that's right. ag against the neuromuscular junction, which reduces, um, the, uh, it actually initi initiates the classical complement pathway leading to cleavage of C5 and the membrane attack, attack complex formation, which causes damage to the neuromuscular junction, you loss of acetylcholine receptors and subsequent uh, impairment in synaptic uh, activity. And so uh, because this is affecting the neuromuscular junction, you see a lot of muscular um, effects. And so including uh, the muscles of the face too, where it looks like the patient has a stroke, but it's bilateral. Because right. uh, right. the facial muscles are, are uh, not as, uh, are weaker. And so some of the first notable notable symptoms are noticeable are in the eye muscles and facial muscles and the patients may have slurred speech. They may have difficulty controlling their eye movements, chewing, talking, swallowing. And uh, uh, in fact, it can also affect the muscles that control breathing. 
um, like the diaphragm and the accessory muscles in the neck. So they can all be affected by uh, this disorder. And the name myasthenia gravis literally means muscle, muscle weakness. weakness. That's grave. It, it, it's uh, basically, a, it can be a terminal disease if it's not yes. treated adequately. So, you know, patients may wake up fine <coughs> during the day, but then feel right. weak by the end of the day. Um, and again, you can see how it affects the uh, eye control muscles, skeletal muscles, uh, breathing muscles, etc. Okay, now let's move on to our medical emergency of the month. Outstanding. All right, we'll wrap things up here. So why don't you take, a, take it away? I will, Jay. I'd, I'd okay. love to. Thank you All right, so much. Sounds good. All right. So this could happen in our dental office any time of the day. We've sort of talked about it in one of a our drugs bit. earlier tonight. Yeah. Um, patients are going to start complaining of nausea. They'll start coughing. They'll start having some wheezing. Mm -hmm. uh, tachypnea, which is a fast respiratory rate, mm -hmm. uh, fast breathing. Tachycardia, which is a fast heart rate cyanosis all right which means yeah. you know, we've got skin that's turning blue okay so yeah because we're not oxygenated right? correct what is happening so emesis leading to aspiration, aspiration. is what's Absolutely. happening here tonight dr resnick yep and as we said it, it will begin as some nausea if you have a sedated patient though you may not see that until they've already regurgitated and aspirated and we just so, talked about that with the, the GLP inhibitors, which mm -hmm. one of them is, is semaglutide or Zempic, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, due to the delayed of gastric emptying. So yeah. you've got to be concerned because not only, as Jay has already said, y'all, uh, it's not just IV sedation, but also if you're using nitrous oxide. Yeah. That's why it's so important that the patients have to have an empty stomach, empty stomach. And they, you know, they can, now the guidelines are they can drink uh, water up to two hours before. And that's actually thought to be beneficial because it aids with gastric emptying. Yes. It also helps um, increase the pH because it neutralizes or washes out some of the gastric acids. But so but basically, the the, 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 this is this slide is showing us where this happens in the brain, the cerebral cortex, the vestibular system, and, and what we yeah. call the CTZ, chemoreceptor trigger zone. Mm -hmm. the, the, and, and then we also have what's called the VC, or vomiting center in the vestibular mm -hmm. system. And both of these gets triggered, and this leads to an active form of vomiting. And, yeah, and all kinds of things can cause it. Anxiety, yes. uh, medications, um, motion probably, sickness, which you know, hopefully you won't see when you're sedating someone in your dental chair. Right. Um, but uh, you know, there are a lot of things that affect that, that affect vomiting. Uh, they affect the vagal nerve, and intestinal instruction to uh, obstruction too, and then functional gastric stasis. On, yes. Yep. The DLP one and GPP four uh, drugs. All right, why is this it's not advanced? Next slide there, Dr. Next Resnick. slide. Next slide. There we go. All right, next slide. Next slide. Let's Technology is great when it works. When it works. It. All right, let's see. Let me try this again. Slides. That says slide 60. 5960, let's say. Um <laughs> We really wanted to send a message Ooh. home on this slide right here. Yeah, let's yeah. see. We, we, there, there'll be a test after this. All right, let's see if it'll work now. Um, oh, there, there we, we go. go. Okay. So uh, our our vomit lesson for the day. Let's see if I can get rid of this. Okay. Is that um, the color of vomit can tell you a lot of information, give you a lot of info. Absolutely. And we're hoping when we do a sedation or nitrous oxide, it's that top one. Yeah. Okay. That we only see clear saliva. And that's uh, clear if, vomit. If, if you were to have passive regurgitation during those procedures in your office, hopefully that will not happen to you. Yeah. And hopefully it's just saliva. Because uh, if it's green, that means there's undigested vial, bile being regurgitated back up from the stomach. If yep. it's yellow, that's digested bile. Digested bile. bile. Yep. yep. And Orange then, course, is not good. No. Uh, partially digested food can also be due to infections. And of course, pink and red tells you that there's some bleeding into the GI tract um, and brown or black, um, which uh, also means they're, <laughs> they've got bleeding, but it's, it's clotted blood. It's old bleeding. Yeah. So it could be due to like peptic ulcer disease. 
and, and that right. requires medical attention. All yeah. right. So again, so the, the mechanism of aspiration, as you can yeah. see here, is when the uh, vomitus comes up from the stomach and then goes down into the lungs. And it leads and, to the aspiration pneumonitis, which is never a good thing. Yeah. Or the food bolus can actually obstruct the trachea obstruct too. Your, that's correct. Not, not just leak into the lungs, but uh, actually block the lungs. So what do we do if uh, we see our patient, we suspect they're about to vomit and aspirate? Well, there, there's our algorithm right there. And our mm -hmm. biggest concern, if they have aspirated, Jay, you know, we've got our signs and symptoms on the left side mm -hmm. of the algorithm right there. Uh, coughing, they could have a laryngospasm, yeah. severe wheezing, uh, the, the elevated respiratory rate, uh, tachycardia, and of course, mm -hmm. cyanosis, which we just yeah. used that's from in the very beginning of the question. Okay, That's all, all from right. irritation of the airway from Th that's right. stuff that shouldn't be there. And, so you know, so you got to terminate, treat, place the patient on the right side because that's going to help slow the vomitus if it has gone down into the trachea, gone yeah. into beyond the carina, now has gotten into the right main stem. Yeah. And uh, it's all due to anatomy, the way the, uh, the angle of the right versus the left main stem is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the right main stem is a little straighter and wider. Yep. So yep. we're trying to confine it to one area. Mm -hmm. um, use a Yankauer suction, suction as much as you can. Yeah. And then you've got to assess for the signs and symptoms of aspiration that we've mm -hmm. gone over. And yeah. if you start to hear any of those, 911, uh, yeah. you're going to have to make that call. Yeah. It's not something you want to mess around. This patient needs to go to, to the hospital. Yeah. And have a bronchoscopy to flush out their lungs. They're going to need IV antibiotics and, you know, ICU stay. As yeah. John just mentioned. All right. Well, I think that about covers it. You mentioned about Pharmadent earlier. Yes. Uh, the great, beginning great, great of our program. webcast. So that's yes. through dentallearning.net. Um, this is kind of a breakdown of what, uh, what the program involves. 15 different classifications of, yes. of drugs that you may see in your patients. And these aren't the drugs we talk about on Pharmadox. These are drugs that have been around for a while that you need to know about. Um, we also have domes on the dental learning website, which is five different modules talking about basically dental office medical emergencies and uh, going through all these algorithms that we talk about when we give our, our medical emergency of the month. And then for those of you who have not done your opioid education for your, uh, for your state, uh, we have a, for, for California, it's a specific two hour course, uh, right. which is available. Um, but also for the other states that don't require a specific course, um, this three hour course covers all the, re all the requirements by all the different states, whether it's a one hour, two hour of three or three hour, um, a requirement. Uh, this also goes toward your three hours towards your mate requirement. Yep. That you've got to do before you uh, renew your license. Renew your, your, renew your DEA license. Yep. And then we got anaphylaxis update 2023. So mm -hmm. uh, two and a quarter hours for you and your staff to be ready. Because, you know, it was interesting when Jay and I did our uh, ad, ad, advanced emergency scores, we had an anaphylactic station mm -hmm. and we called it three minutes to life or death. And, there's so much that you've got to do. I've got news for everyone out there. You are not going to be able to do this by yourself. Yeah. All of our participants saw that firsthand. Yeah. And they saw the significance of having staff involved because yeah. you can't and any medical, any medical emergency you can't treat alone. You, you can't manage the airway and get the drugs ready for this type of disease state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or not it, disease state, but emergency yeah, state. Excuse me. Yeah, exactly. And then we mentioned earlier uh, about oh, Vesper yeah. Institute. Right and here. And so we have our IV sedation training, uh, which is going to be, I think we've got six dates in 2024. Yes. yes. We were, go, our first one's almost filled up, Jay. I mean, oh, we, great. we just, yeah, we just finished our, uh, our October course. Great yeah. turnout, great yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, everybody did fantastic. Yeah. And we've gotten so many emails of people that just said it was a great experience. Well, and the thing about it, Jay, it, we, we're, we're putting everyone in an atmosphere that's just 
comforting. Um, it, it's a great environment to learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, me, Dr. Sayre are the main three. We're there the entire time. Yeah. All right? And, you know, the thing is that, that there are, I think it was like 30% of people, at least in the yes. U.S., will not go to the dentist because they're afraid of going to the dentist for because of an experience they had in the past or very anxious uh, because of experiences they've had in the past or just generalized anxiety. And if you That's can provide right. moderate IV sedation to these patients, your practice will grow like gangbusters uh, once oh, yeah. everybody in your community knows that you're providing this service. Yeah. And so it's a great course that actually, we actually give you more than the required uh, number of didactic hours uh, as required by pretty much every state. Most yes. states require 60 hours. We provide you, I think, something like 75, I think. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then clinical cases, you need to have at least 20. And if you want to do more than 20, 25 or 30, you can actually yeah. do this as part of our course. And what's really great is your mentors, your one-on-one -on -one mentors for the, uh, the hands-on course are not John and I, um, but general dentists who are trained and have been practicing IV sedation. They are, they are your peers that, Correct. you know, we know how to do sedation for oral surgery. They will teach you how to do sedation for general dentistry. Correct. As well as surgical procedures and implants. And, and you know, right. too, Jay, plus we've got, you know, an awesome simulation program as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I love part our, of it. Yeah, our hands-on is out outstanding. Yeah. So any of you, if you're considering this, please take a look at the Vesper Institute site. Mm -hmm. we, we'd love to have you uh, participate in our program because uh, we just want to elevate you to the next level. That's yeah, VesperInstitute.com. So our next yeah. uh, PharmaDocs, uh, episode is in December on December 8th. 8th. Yes. And of course, we're going to talk about new drugs, new medications, um, and new, new medical emergencies. New medical emergencies. Absolutely. So with that, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. All right. We'll see you after Thanksgiving. Don't That's eat right. too much. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.